Chapter 8. Come on Sweet William, Sweet William, sang Patsy, catching her small brother by the hand and dancing down the walk. Let's go to Broadacres for a look around. Alice, uh, Alice, she called Alice Blair, who was sitting in the swing with her knitting. Come and see how our gardens are growing. We've been so busy being field hands for Mr. Spencer's cotton. I've not been to our garden for two whole days. I ran by to look at it this morning, said Alice. I feel real lonesome if I don't see it every day. So do I, agreed Patsy. I know now how David felt that first year he had corn at Happy Acres, and he used to go by to see it every time he was sent to the store for the mail or a spool of thread. At the garden gate they paused and called Ruth. She came out on the back porch but stopped at the head of the steps. I've Jay just come in, she said. I weeded a row of PPs. Now I'm helping mother. I'll see you PP presently. The others went into the garden, admired the flourishing vegetables, and pulled up a few stray weeds. Isn't it Betorious? exclaimed Patsy. Things have just been leaping and bounding along these two days. Scrumptious, agreed Alice. We all boys have got the biggest potatoes, said Sweet William, wagging his head proudly. You all boys. Boys. Will you look at those beans? What about them Mr. William Talia Farrow Osborne? Demanded Patsy. Anne Lewis had a lot to say about their Washington gardens. They aren't a bit better than this, they can't be. Just think, Anne is coming next week. Goody, goody, goody cried sweet William, clapping his hands. As they went chattering back up the walk, Ruth came out to ask them to stay to supper. Her mother had a strawberry shortcake. I'll go and ask if mother knew began Patsy and Alice. If I had a piece of strawberry shortcake in my hand suggested sweet William. I could go home and tell them you were invited. We are going to have batter cakes for supper. Emma makes good little batter cakes with lacy brown edges. Patsy was properly horrified at her small brother's greediness. But Mrs. Wilson laughed and sent him home munching a generous slice of shortcake. After supper Mrs. Wilson and the girls went out on the front porch. It was wide and long, set high on brick pillars, with a flight of steps leading down to the long boxwood bordered walk. There is a loose railing said Mrs. Wilson. I must nail it in place tomorrow. You are as careful about mending and tending broad acres as you are about Ruth's darning, and patching laughed Patsy. Yes, said Mrs. Wilson. It's all in the family. Broad Acres is a dear old part of the family. How old is it cousin Agnes? The house was built in 1762, said Mrs. Wilson, with quiet pride. It was made strong, to be a fort, in case of Indian attacks. That is why the shutters are so thick, with the little hinged middle pieces for loopholes to fire from. The Yankees came by here in the war, said Ruth. In April, 65 agreed her mother. The doors and shutters were closed, with crepe hanging from them, in mourning for the dead Confederacy. Sherman's men marched past, without disturbing the house, thinking there was a corpse in it. This very bench where SS sitting on is C called the President's Bench because W.W. Washington sat here when he was V visiting my way back grandfather. Tell about that, mother said Ruth. But an interruption came before Mrs. Wilson could begin the story. The more loved because it was old and well known. The front gate clicked. Patsy glanced toward it and, seeing a Negro girl standing there, exclaimed in surprise, why, there's Lou Ellen. Go to the side gate, Lou Ellen Mrs. Wilson said sharply. What do you mean by coming the front way? I ain't coming in said Lou Ellen, in a pert, high voice, as she lounged on the gate. I just come to the store, and stop to leave you a message Miss Agnes. I was coming down to Mill Path and a man I reckon he was Van Hollered to me, and said, Mr. Black Mayo say for you please him to go and spend a night with Miss Polly. He got to go away and she was feeling sort o' puny, and he didn't want to left her at home by herself. It's strange he didn't tell me when he was in the village today, said Mrs. Wilson. Van told you, you say. It sounded like Van answered Lou Ellen. He was in the woods and I didn't see him good. She tossed her head and strolled away. She's a horrid thing, said Ruth. How could she help it? asked Alice. Her mother, Lalvany, is as trifling as she can be, and so is her father, Lincoln. And his father is that horrid old Solomon Gabe that they call a trick doctor. All the other darkies are afraid of him. 
Darkies are queer things laughed Patsy. And then she told what Emma had said about the draft. She isn't the only one who believes that, said Alice. Unkisham told father he'd heard tell they are all going to be put back in slavery. He said they always told him if the Democrats got strong in power, they would make the darkies slaves again. I wonder how they get these foolish notions into their heads, said Mrs. Wilson. Well, chickens, Ruth and I must be starting to Larkland. Let Ruth spend the night with me, cousin Agnes entreated Patsy. Mrs. Wilson consented, and the three girls walked with her as far as the mill on her way to Larkland. Sweet William did not see them go, and he was surprised to find the house dark and deserted when he came running back, with Scalawag at his heels, for his sweater. He went, with a little feeling of awe. Down the summer boxwood walk it was now nearly dark and it was a relief to hear Scalawag, who had run ahead of him, give a sharp bark. Cat's s, cat's s, hissed sweet William urgingly. Scalawag ran to a rose arbor at the back of the garden, but his furious barking changed to a sudden yelp and whine. He ran back to his master. Old tabby cat must have scratched you, said sweet William. Sick her, sick her, Scalawag. But the dog, bristling and growling, kept at his master's heels, as if unwilling to encounter again whatever he had found in that dark, secluded place. Sweet William groped around for his sweater and ran home. Then he had his bath and went to bed. The older children followed soon, as behooved those who must be at Sunday school at half past nine o'clock, and Noah saw him in the story of Gideon, and be ready to answer seven new questions in the shorter catechism. The next morning, when the Osbournes were at breakfast, Steve came running into the room, with a tragic face. Our gardens are ruined, he cried. Oh Steve, what do you mean, ruined? They can't be, ruined, he repeated, with doleful emphasis. I went by there, just after breakfast, taking our cow to pasture. I saw the gate open. left it open, demanded David, and Miss Fanny Morrison's old cow was there, gorging herself on our corn and peas. Everything is grazed off, trampled down, with no more appetites for breakfast. The war gardeners ran to broad acres, to see the wreck of their gardens. But who left the gate open? David demanded sternly. We were the last ones here, said Patsy and I know we shut it. I was here about dark sweet William confessed bravely. I came for my sweater. But I shut the gate and I fastened it. I had to climb up on the garden fence to put the hook in the hole. You didn't put it in Patsy said severely. You let it slip to the side. And our gardens are ruined. It's my garden, too. And I did fasten the gate sobbed sweet William. He seemed so clearly the culprit that black looks and little pity were being given him when Mrs. Wilson came up. She too, was horrified and distressed. But she said, if sweet William is sure he fastened the gate. I am sure he fastened it. There is something strange about this matter. Mayo did not send for me. He is away. But Polly had told him she would have Chrissy sleep in the house. She was surprised but of course pleased to see me. I would have come back home if it hadn't been so late. Could Lou Ellen have done it? Suggested Patsy. She came with that message, and she's so purred and horrid. They examined the premises carefully, near the rose arbor, at the back of the garden, they found footprints, the track of a big, bare, flat foot. Dick carefully made a copy of it on a piece of paper. And Mr. Blair and Mr. Red Mayo Osborne went with the gardeners to Lincoln's cabin on the Redville Road, and confronted Lou Ellen. She stoutly denied the charge, and when her foot was measured, it proved to be much smaller than the print. Evidently, then, she was not the intruder. Who could it be? That was a doleful Sabbath for the young villagers. They were thinking more about their wrecked garden than their Sunday school lesson. The sermon fell on deaf ears, and in the afternoon they stood mournfully around the scene of their destroyed hopes. But with the next morning came cheer and good counsel. Blackmail, having come back on an early train, stopped at the post office and was told about the catastrophe, and he went to view the garden. It is pretty bad, 
But it might be worse, he said cheerily. Some of these things will come up from the roots. Some of the rows will have to be plowed up and planted in things that will still have plenty of growing time. The soil is in fine condition. Let's get to work and make a garden day of it. One of you boys go to Larkland and get Rosinante and a plow. Mr. Tavis came to help them, and so did Mr. Blair who shut up the post office, saying casually that anyone who came for mail could look him up or wait till he got back. Several hours of diligent, intelligent toil worked wonders. The gardens would be later, of course, but with a long growing season before them that was no serious disadvantage. It would require more work, much more work, but that they were all willing and glad to give. Why, Dick had offered to help this morning, and he had been just as interested and busy as anyone else. Perhaps he would join the garden club now, but he did not. When Mr. Osborne went home to dinner, Dick started off with him to get a pigeon for a trial flight. Patsy looked after him and set her lips firmly. Just you wait, young man she promised him till next week when Ann Lewis comes. We'll show you what it means to dare and double dare us. For weeks Dick had been going off alone every few days, and coming back late tired and dirty, and with a joyful air of mystery. The others were too busy with gardening, and Red Cross and Corn Club work, to make any real effort to find out where he went. But he always watched to make sure that he was not followed, and he never relaxed his precautions at the mine. He pulled his ladder in and out, blurred his footprints, and stirred up the dead leaves, so as not to make a path. It would take, he proudly thought, a Sherlock Holmes or a bloodhound to trace his course. He had examined the main room without seeing any place that it seemed worth, while to work in the crude fashion possible to him. The most promising places, he thought, were in the spurs of the lower tunnel, where there was more clay than rock. If he dug a little farther a few inches or some feet perhaps, he would find silver that the miners had missed. He planned to extend each spur a certain distance. At first he said 10 feet, but a little work convinced him that was too far, so he decided to go 6 feet or 5 or 4. It was too discouraging to compute how long it would take to go even 4 feet, at his snail-like rate of progress. He could not use alone the drill and sledgehammer he had brought from Mr. Mallet's shop, so he had to content himself with digging along a ledge, breaking off rough bits of rock, and eagerly examining them for silver. He had inquired furtively about dynamite, but the law made it difficult for him to get it fortunately, for in his ignorant, inexperienced hands, there would probably have been an accident which might even have cost him his life. On this pleasant June afternoon, Dick went blithely with his cousin Mayo to Larkland. He nearly always went there on his way to the old Sterling mine. It was only half a mile off the road, and the distance to the mine seemed shorter to him, when he had a carrier pigeon for company. Breeding and blood were telling in the Larkland pigeons. Mr. Osborne showed Dick that afternoon a marked copy of the bird world telling, with big headlines, about the thousand-mile flight of a young pigeon trained by Mr. Mayo Osborne, of Virginia. I bet Snapshot will make a record too, said Dick, stroking the plumage of a petted young bird. Dick said Mr. Osborne, suddenly, I'm glad to have your help and interest about these birds. I want you to learn all you can about training them. Your cousin Polly knows all there is to know about their feeding and care. But when I go away, oh, you are going away, interrupted Dick. When, cousin Mayo, early this fall, I hope, as soon as some business matters can be arranged, I've been wanting to be in the army from the first. I said you would go. It wasn't true you wanted to stay at home playing with birds. Mr. Osborne looked at Dick and started to ask a question, but it did not seem worthwhile. So he merely said, When I leave, I'm going to ask your father to let you stay here at Larkland with your cousin Polly and help her with the doves, our doves of war. Thank you, Cousin Mayo. I'll do my best, promised Dick. Mr. Osborne wrote a note and fastened it to the bird's leg that was always part of the ceremony. 
and he put it into a makeshift cage, an old shoe box with holes punched in it, and gave it to Dick. Where are you going? Asked Mr. Osborne. To the mine creek said Dick, almost telling his secret. It was hard not to give a forthright answer to his cousin's direct look. Why don't you boys do you ever go to the old sterling mine? Maybe so. Sometimes, he mumbled. Black Mayo did not notice the boy's conscious air. He was watching his pigeons fluttering and circling about, white against the woodland, dark against the shining sky. I used to go there, he said. Ah, <sighs> the hours and days I spent seeking its treasure. It was one of the great adventures of my boyhood. Did you ever find any? Any silver in the mine? I mean, Dick asked eagerly. His cousin gave a smiling negative. Do you suppose? Perhaps there isn't any. Dick's voice dropped in disappointment. I believe there is, said Black Mayo. Silver was found there by Old Mallet. Not long after the revolution, you've heard the tale handed down in his family. Some years ago, when I was rummaging through old court records, I found the account of his trial for feloniously making uttering, and passing false and counterfeited coin in the likeness and similitude of Spanish milled dollars, of the value of six shillings current money of Virginia. That was in 1792. But the mine was worked after that, wasn't it? Asked Dick. Oh, yes. My grandfather Mayo, your great-grandfather, had it worked, but it never paid. It doesn't seem reasonable that the old blacksmiths faded out all the silver that was there. There's a tale that a valuable vein was struck and lost. You might take a look around today, and you and I might go prospecting some time, he said, now looking keenly at Dick. The boy reddened to the roots of his hair. Yes, sir, he said. It's time I was gone. Mayo Osborne looked after him with a whimsical smile, straight to the old sterling mine. I'll wager my head, he laughed.